Hi, everybody. Welcome to today's ISE webinar. Um, welcome back if you just returned from holiday. Um, it's still still quite nice and warm, a bit muggy today, actually, but it feels like we're at the start of the, of the next recruitment season. So what better time to be having a session really looking at actually how we hire graduates and how we might rethink how we um, target target those, those candidates and, and, um, and, and get them through our, through our selection processes. Um, this is probably the most challenging I've known the market for a number of years and I've been in this game for a while that number of vacancies, the uncertainties of where students are, um, all the employees we talk to I know are finding it very challenging and of course with all the unknowns of a, of a new recruitment season. So looking forward to a really really rich session. Um, if you haven't joined an IC webinar before, my name is Steve, Steve Isherwood, I'm the IC um, Chief Executive. Um, I'll be um, I'll be I'll be behind the scenes so I'll be I'll be looking at the chat function, the Q&A, so please um, please join in the conversation. We'd like these sessions to be as interactive as possible. I know Simon's got some time at the end to um, um, to, to answer any questions that you may have. So do pop them in the chat, pop them in the Q&A. Um, I'll keep an eye on those and put them through to Simon at the end. Um, we are recording the session. Um, again, you may well know that we put, our, um, uh, we put our recordings onto our website and also onto our YouTube channel so that if you um, want to recap some of the stuff that we've covered, then you can do that. But also, actually, if you want to share the knowledge, you think this might be useful for somebody else, please do. Um, please do um, um, share the links and pass them on that we'll send after you to otherwise. And also, um, in case we're out of time at the end, a big thank you to Timon and the team at Modern Hire. It's great to have supportive organisations like yourselves, members like us. Um, without your help, we couldn't put on content like this. So, right, that's enough for me. Let's get into the into the content. That's what you really came along here for. So, Simon, Simon, over to you. Simon, Solution Director for, for Modern Hire. Steve, thank you so much. And uh, just firstly, just to begin with, I'd like to take this opportunity just to thank everybody uh, for joining us here uh, for today's session, Hiring for Potential, uh, Rethinking Graduate Hires. Um, in this session, I'm going to be talking all about potential and picking what it is um, and what we can do to identify it um, and the ways in which we can select high potential candidates. As Steve said, in a very tumultuous market, there's a lot of new challenges out there, as mentioned, as, as well as the kind of those existing challenges that we're aware of, mitigating things like cognitive bias as part of it a standardized fair assessment process just a really uh, sort of a minor point of how housekeeping for myself um, i'm going to provide my email address at the end of today's session um just if you have any of those sort of uh, those questions uh, that escape you kind of in the session and you want to follow up or you want any information um at modern hire we've got a lot of webinar uh, webinar recordings on demand we've got a lot of um white papers and things like that as well um so if you have any follow-up please do just reach out i'm always happy to hear from you all Okay, so just by way of a very quick introduction, my name is Simon Davis, a Solutions Director for EMEA at Modern Hire. Uh, I'm a business psychologist by background, um, and I specialize in selection and assessment. I'm very fortunate in my career to be able to work with and have worked with lots of capable uh, high potential graduates uh, and early career candidates um, from across lots of different industries. So graduate recruitment and uh, selection assessment has been my kind of my forte for quite some time. I will apologise for the rather smug looking photo. It was the best of a very bad bunch, I assure you. Um, before we get onto the good stuff, uh, all about potential, I want to provide you with just a very quick introduction um, to, to Modern Hire, who we are and, and what we do, because I appreciate there may be sort of variable levels of understanding about who we are. So. First and foremost, uh, Modern Hire are, are a global uh, technology platform provider, and we specialize in selection and assessment. Everything we do at Modern Hire is grounded in what we refer to as the four E's of hiring. We don't just use these for purely alliterative purposes or for the added marketing benefit, although it does some, sometimes help. Um, but each of these four E's represent the challenges or those blockers uh, that are central to a successful selection and assessment campaign. So maybe some of these speak to your, your experiences. So when we talk about efficient, we're talking about issues concerning time to fill and recruiter productivity. Activity. Um, one of the biggest challenges um, that our clients are facing at the moment, our recruitment teams, um, is the need to do, that classic phrase, is the need to do more with less and less. And they're expected to sift enormous volumes of candidates, often 100, 150 to 200 a day on a completely case by case manual basis, even if our client recruitment teams are able to manage this monumental challenge. There's no guarantee that we um, are, are doing this in the most efficient way, but also there's no guarantee it's gonna be done in the most fair way, the most standardized way. So when it comes to efficiency, optimizing, streamlining, and generally creating those efficiencies wherever possible is the central requirement here. Um, we've supported our, our clients in reducing overall time to offer and time to hire, um, usually through, through automation. 
and by cutting the numbers of hours the amount of time your recruitment heads have to invest in the process itself without compromising on quality effective so effective is, is kind of like it does what it says on the tin are we assessing what we think we're assessing are we predicting performance and potential in role um, and this concerns things like average turnover and the costs of a poor hire you you only need to go and do a quick google search a quick web search to learn all about the costs of a bad hire maybe less obvious is the is the cost of calculating um the um those uh those um associated with a sort of premature turnover and things like that it's a little bit more difficult to unpick but again vital and and important to try and reduce those costs as as best as humanly possible um ethical um it concerns legal compliance from purely a table stake standpoint um as well as supporting the various dni initiatives our clients have um, so recently we've been we've been uh, working with a few clients and we've been able to achieve um, a 40 percent increase in ethnic diversity hiring in our campaigns, as well as a 25 percent um, increase in gender diversity and new hiring with some of our clients, which is very exciting stuff. And then finally, engaging. Uh, this concerns all things experiential and we're looking to strike a strong balance between candidate experience and also a seamless, easy recruiter experience. Um, you know, we're talking about hiring for potential today, and I want to make sure I contextualize everything in that. And so with grads, we're talking about digital natives. You know, they're not like they're not like us in, in a sense, you know, um, you know, far from experiencing the tedium and frustration of dial up Internet um, and wobbly search engines and things like that. Grads are used to applications that work simply and effectively every single time. And our assessments simply have to reflect this. We cannot lose talent, or we cannot afford to lose talent because of shaky algorithms and unresponsive, uh, unresponsive technology and things like that. Okay, so I uh, don't want to sound too much like Simon Sinek, but our, if our four E's are our why, um, then our cognition, our science, essentially, um, technology and optimization are our how, how we go about doing what we do. We've got over 45 advanced degree IO psychologists and data scientists who crunch the numbers, they design, they implement and they validate all of our assessments so we know that they're fit for purpose. Okay, we're conducting over 30 million interviews and assessments annually. Um, and what we do is we're constantly refining, iterating um, and improving uh, to make sure that we stay on top of an ever changing talent landscape. It goes back to what Steve said at the start. Things are constantly in flux. They're constantly changing when it comes to grad recruitment. We've got to make sure that we're also doing the same thing. OK, so and lastly, on the outermost ring, we have our what. So the physical products that we're using, these are the things that we are doing um, to make hiring more efficient, essentially more effective. So starting at 12 o'clock, you have text screenings um, for those killer questions, things like that, accessible by mobile, uh, laptop, tablet, all that kind of stuff. Um, all the way through to realistic previews of roles, virtual job tryouts, which we'll go on to a little bit more in, in the near future. Um, this concerns, uh, the, these are our assessments, essentially, it's a synonym for our assessments. And then our interviews, our scheduling and our live interviewing as well. So what we're trying to do is bring this all together in what we refer to as the intelligent hiring platform. OK, so and uh, this is kind of one of my personal favorite slides because it just kind of demonstrates where we really fit in after the point of awareness and sourcing and before that checking, verifying and final onboarding. And the reason that we focus our efforts and our expertise here is because we can do the heavy lifting for our clients without taking away the really the really vital uh, face to face interactions that our clients want to have with their candidates, which is more than understandable. Okay, these are some of the clients that we are working with currently. I assure you it's not so much a brag as it is just a kind of a, an indication of, because we're working across all these various uh, verticals and industries, um, they all come with their own unique challenges that we have to consider, all these various unique um, considerations that have to be made for each of our clients and how we can perfect um, the appropriate solution. There's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all model. And this really just kind of summarizes uh, what I've said already. We're, we're working with uh, 47 of the Fortune 100 companies. I have a sneaking suspicion that number's actually gone up. Um, and we're working over 200 countries and territories, which, again, brings me back to the point around just being able to adapt to various requirements across lots of different industries. OK, 
Okay, so without further ado, thank you for for um, for allowing me to give you give the opportunity for a bit of an intro to modern hire. But we're here obviously to talk about potential. You know what it is, and it's an incredibly nebulous concept. It's it's an area of, of a particular enthusiasm and passion for myself. I went through various grad processes when I was younger, um, and I I always felt that there was something there that was being missed. You know, and and so it's become a very personal um, area of interest for myself. So what is potential? I suppose should be the the, the starting question really. It's it's a it's a nebulous concept that's often cited as the off-cited key to success in organizations. We often hear the word juxtaposed with performance or candidate past performance. Um, as a marker of success, um, but is it a zero sum game between performance and potential is it one or the other black and white, or are they one and the same Do they overlap. So really to understand potential, we have to bring things back, um, all the way back actually to 2008. You may be familiar with the work of the psychologist Malcolm Gladwell. Um, in 2008, he wrote the book Outliers um, and explored the nature of success in a very general sense. Um, it may seem somewhat dated now, but it essentially reignited interest in the topic of human potential, um, you know, what is possible, essentially. And while um, he talks of success in a general sense, there are many direct applications with the world of work, um, in particular in candidate selection, especially in early careers. Um, in it, he talks about how traditional measures um, or predictors of success, such as IQ testing, fall short of the mark. Now, assuming you're all practitioners or, or affiliated with practitioners, I know of very few now that, that, that believe that IQ testing alone is the way forward. So we've, we've sort of moved on from that a little bit. IQ testing does remain one of the single best predictors of performance in role. But we must remember the operative word there, which is single. That statement is only true when you're viewing variables in isolation. We know that the workplace of today requires much more from talented employees, and indeed talented employees have so much more that they can give. Indeed, I, I, traditional methods such as IQ testing is predictive to an extent, but often we find it plateaus, and I believe that's around about the sort of 70th percentile, and very often can have diminishing returns as well. Gladwell pointed to the fact that traditional framing and the understanding of success generally is similarly outmoded. And we learn that success is far from linear. So instead, success, and this is where we bring it back to potential, it maps to what is known as a Pareto distribution. So a curve that does a little bit like this, um, where you see a hyper small minority of individuals, our high potential individuals essentially, are responsible for most of the creative output or productivity. This is also true within a workplace environment. The famous off-sited example that's given here is that of classical composers. Um, so while it might sound a little bit abstract, is a good way of framing the, the, the importance of this. So when you consider the majority of music that is played by orchestras today around the world is written by just three composers, so Beethoven, Bach and Mozart. And it works at different levels as well. So for each of those composers, only a hyper small minority of the music that they ever wrote or is actually played by those orchestras themselves. So most of the B-sides essentially are getting forgotten and, and consigned to history. But you can see how you have that scaling effect and we see the same thing in a workplace environment. It's a bit of a square root law. Essentially, in a company of 10 people, maybe three people are gonna do almost half of the work it is estimated. But in a company of 100 people, maybe it's, it's gonna, that, that, that number is gonna diminish right down in terms of ratio and it's gonna be something more like 10 people are gonna pick up at least half the slack. And yet, one of the biggest pieces of research or one of the most well-known pieces was done by Harvard Business Review. And they looked at uh, potential and the way that potential is viewed in the workplace. And they found that most companies are in general agreement. They thought that only between three and 5% of their staff could be considered high potential individuals. So why are organizations having such a hard time of understanding potential? It's very clear that high performing uh, employees and high potential employees are very different and so the ability to spot it early perhaps even at the point of assessment let's say for our sake um, is increasingly important to to unpick and understand in more detail so why are we having such a hard time of it well traditional approaches and I'm sure I'm telling you something you're all completely aware of and cognizant of but traditional approaches typically have always inferred future performance what what can you do for our company essentially based on prior performance this has been the norm for decades. It's spanning back to the production line staff. I'm using an image, I think, taken from General Motors um, or, or Henry Ford, I think, one of their, their many uh, manufacturing plants, uh, the assembly line. 
But everything that we do in, in assessment typically has been drawn from an environment like this, where individuals were expected to perform discrete tasks and could complete them over and over and over again to the same exact standard. The modern workplace is significantly different, however, of course, and requiring employees to adapt, to shift, to deal with a multitude of different stakeholders and competing priorities. COVID restrictions and the immediate or uh, transition to, to remote and hybrid forms of working have only exacerbated this complexity, the need to be able to use and work in a digital environment, for example. Some psychologists uh, adopted the, the acronym, you may be familiar with it, VUCA, which describes the modern work environment. Uh, so that stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity as well. So volatility concerns the nature and speed of change, Uncertainty, as the name suggests, a lack of predictability in the workplace, constantly being asked to do things that the work, the job title simply doesn't entail. Um, complexity, the multiplex of different forces of confounding issues and no immediate cause and effects. I'm sure we've all at one point or another in time found ourselves thinking to ourselves, I don't quite understand how the work that I'm doing today feeds into the bigger picture of what the company is trying to achieve. In fact, I, you, you may have noticed yourself, that's often a very common question used in employee engagement these days. Um, and ambiguity, the blurriness of, of reality, finally, the potential for misreads and the mixed meanings of, con of, of conditions. While the VUCA acronym might sound slightly hyperbolic, there is a reason for that. It was first introduced um, in the, the, the US military academy. And while some workplace environments might feel a little bit tumultuous, we're very fortunate to say that they are, generally speaking, not the Army War College. Um, so, so what does this all mean for our graduates when, when taken together, um, you know, the potential goldmine of talent we could have sitting uh, at our feet, essentially, unbeknownst to us, in a world that constantly requires more from its top performers. Okay, so without further ado, I'd like to really start unpacking what potential, how we define potential, essentially. And the first thing I really want to stress is that when we're talking about a potential focus, we are not saying that all of the efforts thus far that have looked at past performance are completely outdated. They must be thrown out like almost, you know, the, the kind of the baby with the bathwater scenario. We're not saying that at all. We don't want to um, throw out all of our efforts of standardized methods of assessment that are valid and predictive. A major part of potential, first, the first part of potential is competence, which we all know and are very familiar with and we assess against every day. Um, knowledge, skills and attributes. We can't consider somebody to be a high potential individual if they don't have competence to do a role, of course. The thing is that we've relied largely upon CV screening, resume sifting and competency-based interviews that are all kind of secondary forms of evidence. Um, much of the picture that we paint around performance has always been competency based and relies on prior work experience. This brings us back to our graduate situation. It's less than ideal when we consider a population such as graduates um, who, by definition, has fewer work relevant sources to draw upon. So um, uh, researchers at Florida State University, uh, Van Eidekinji um, and his colleagues reviewed 81 separate studies uh, to investigate the link between an employee's prior work experience uh, and his or her performance in a new organization. They found no significant correlation whatsoever between work experience and performance in role. Even when people had completed tasks, held roles, and worked in functions or industries relevant to their current ones, it didn't translate into better performance. Um, and just to kind of compound that, the research team went on to explore. Uh, they used monster.com, the very famous job uh, board um, website. They explored over 115 job ads um, and found that 82% either required or stated a very strong preference for experience for their candidates. Uh, there would be employees. Most organizations clearly think that it is important even for entry level roles, and yet the data doesn't suggest that that's the case at all in terms of its validity, in terms of its predictive power. We've seen some changes in the industry, of course. We've seen the slow or long end of degree requirements and the emphasis placed on academic achievement, but we have to make sure we're replacing it with it. We don't want to lose the capability um, of, of, our, of our candidates, but we want to make sure that we are assessing the relevant things as time times change. Okay, so the next piece of defining potential is behavior. 
Cool. So again, we have behavioral forms of assessment. You didn't come and join this session for me to tell you things you already know. These two, these two areas of defining potential, these aspects are pretty straightforward and fairly intuitive. And we've seen efforts to explore the behavioral uh, dimensions of various um, uh, of, of, of candidates across different industries and indeed at an entry level as well. We have things like behavioral based assessments. We have things like behavioral interview questions as well. But this doesn't tell us everything we need to know. So the other things that we need to explore that define potential, essentially, it's not a complete departure from the traditional methods. It is an augmentation of what we're already doing, uh, a difference of emphasis, if you like. And the next piece is interpersonal skills in the context of the role. Just to be clear, potential is not defined by the most uh, uh, gregarious and extroverted person in the room. It's a case of marrying up the interpersonal requirements of the role itself and one's ability to do that, essentially. So we're looking not for the most extroverted person in the room. We're looking for the person who is able to engage their networks and work across teams with confidence. And with that comes adaptability. It really takes us back to the, the, the VUCA piece um, as well. The ability to adapt, to shift, to changing landscapes. We cannot afford to define roles in the way that we once used to, which is a really fixed criteria. You will be doing A, B, and C on repeat, rinse and repeat. We can no longer do this. Roles are constantly shifting. They're constantly changing. And so individuals have to be confident in working across changing situations talking to different stakeholders, presenting, um, analyzing information in different ways, reporting it in ways that are meaningful to different audiences, essentially. Another aspect that's sometimes forgotten, sometimes overlooked, is the idea of leadership. But we don't mean this in any, um, any formal sense of leadership. It's, it's fairly nonsensical um, to, to expect graduates to be immediately able to perform in a formal sense of leadership. What is meant by leadership in the context of potential is the ability to make confident, informed decisions, um, to rationally present a point of view and to guide people with the, with the knowledge that you do have, essentially. And lastly, the aspirational side of things. Potential wouldn't be potential without first defining it as the attitudinal um, will, the will to succeed, to strive and to, to want to achieve more, essentially. This is admittedly very hard to, um, to, to ascertain, particularly in, in, in grad populations. Grads don't always know what they want to do in the next five or 10 years, making this a very difficult task for recruitment managers. What's worse is, is, is kind of contemporary efforts to understand the aspirational side of things very often start rewarding proxies. So in interview questions, for example, you can very often receive very carefully sculpted interview responses to how do you see what do you see yourself doing in this company in five years time? It doesn't mean that the candidate has any intention of doing that or any intention of even attempting to make that true. That is that is a central issue. We've seen other attempts as well. Uh, culture fit, for example, the idea of trying to align what the culture is presented as um, with it's kind of offered as a bit of a middle of the road solution. Um, SSQs or self-selection questionnaires at the start of assessments are also used. Um, but there are problems with both of these. With the former, it gives rise um, to, to bias. Um, you know, culture fit can very quickly become um an unfortunate backdoor um, for things like affinity bias, like me bias, um, and prototyping, of course. And with SSQs, um, we open ourselves up to, to, to things like tedium and just assessment fatigue. If candidates in this, this ever-changing, very quickly changing, uh, rapidly evolving market are being asked to answer anywhere between 12 to 15, even 30 questions as part of a self-selection questionnaire, whether this role is right for them or not, before they even begin their assessment, um, it was very likely to, to, to turn people away straight away. Okay, so what I want to do is explore the difference between the expectation, what candidates have, what, what can, candidates with high potential have um, for their assessment experience and their recruitment journey versus the reality that's what being presented. So way back in May, uh, we held a webinar uh, on the six elements of a great candidate experience. And there are elements of that that I would like to draw upon um, once more. I mean, I'm kind of giving it away with the imagery here. Um, but um, 
in it, we discussed how 55% of candidates uh, in a piece of research recently conducted um, believe, so the majority of candidates believe that the assessment process should take no more um, than between one and two weeks from the first interaction to final job offer. We know a priori that that simply isn't a reality for many candidates that have to wait weeks and weeks, if not months and months, to hear back successfully or unsuccessfully. From our research, Modern Hire have been exploring this topic in a bit more detail. They found that high potential candidates, and quite understandably, of course, are far more likely to receive competitive offers and drop out, compounding this effect. Typically, we're seeing around about 10 days, you know, high potential candidates, even at a grad level, are spending roughly 10 days um, as kind of a free agent, if you like, before being snapped up by uh, a rival offer. These findings are quite startling. They may lead us to assume that the shortest, the quickest assessment is best. Um, however, this is not true based on the, the, the research that we've been able to explore. Assessments typically, you know, as short as five minutes may be seen as diminishing the importance of one's career. Um, and we also find that candidates, contrary to maybe what might be popular opinion, candidates don't actually tend to drop out of an assessment process during an assessment. You get a slight spike at the very start, which is understandable. And if you're using the appropriate um, sort of information sharing, you're showing what the role is all about, that might be a good thing. There is such a thing as good candidate drop off if the role is not right for them. It saves us a lot of time and energy. Instead, what we find is that candidates typically drop out not during assessment stages, but between assessment stages. Our research indicates that with multiple moving parts, and again, sorry to bring it back to COVID, I'm sure we're all kind of COVIDed out at this point, um, but it really exacerbated this problem. We saw lots of piecemeal and patchwork approaches to graduate assessment with multiple moving parts. You know, some parts were manual telephone interviews, for example, where you'd have to contact them and by email, wait for them to come back to you, hope it didn't go into their junk email um, before finally scheduling a time, which then may get changed three or four times. Um, then moving on to something else, a psychometric, and then waiting ages to finally be invited to some sort of clunky feeling virtual assessment center that's been kind of um, created at kind of very short notice because of the sudden shift to remote working. The, the, the piecemeal approach essentially takes these minor stepping stones and, and exaggerates them. And very quickly, those small gaps quickly start to look like hurdles to cross um, and mountains to climb. And that's before you even sit down and engage in a one-to-one -one final stage interview for the organization that you've applied for. Finally, we do a lot of work um, with uh, various information houses as well. Um, and Gartner uh, recently published a very, a very interesting piece of research that explore the topic of gamification in more detail. Of course, gamification is incredibly popular this day and age and has been applied um, incredibly liberally to, to, to graduate assessment in particular. Um, the Gartner research, however, um, brought this kind of trend into question. It seems like this, this fascination with gamification may be brought to a somewhat of an abrupt end. Um, it was very clear from their research that candidates preferred work sample and job knowledge assessments, but they rarely received them. In fact, anywhere between just 30 and 40 percent of candidates were actually receiving such an assessment. Games and puzzles were rated and reported as the least preferred assessment type. And it may be that the basic logic, the intentions were good, the intentions were there, but it may be that the base logic was a little bit too simple. You know, we know that graduates, generally speaking, like games. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to like assessment games as a gateway to their careers. When graduates say they like games, they're talking about Call of Duty, they're talking about FIFA. They're not talking about tasks that have very strict time limits on it that are stressful all the same. They are assessments at the end of the day. Candidates, the, the, the findings uh, indicated that candidates may not like these types of assessments um, because they often seem unrelated to the job, which is pretty, pretty understandable. Um, but at worst, they may just diminish the seriousness of the life decision that the candidate is facing. They've gone through years of education. They're looking to make a break into the world of work and they want to be given the opportunity to showcase what they can do. And so given those data sets, assessments should be really highly job relevant. So I actually shared this slide in our last process. So forgive me for recycling a few bits of information. I put my hands up to that. Um, but I just want to, just a few bits of consideration just to have a quick read of, but essentially augmenting the assessment process um, so that we are ready and able to spot high potential talent is vital. And yet we can see how traditional process typically are falling short. 
Um, there was a, a sort of a large scale piece of research done uh, by Talent Board. It is unfortunately way back in 2018, but it was one of the largest of its kind. There was 100, 130,000 uh, respondents in total. And they found that the major factors for withdrawing um, or, or selecting different offers was actually concerning things like time disrespected during the process and the process taking too long. These are things that can be firmed up with the appropriate configuration. Okay. So all in all, how, how do we hire better? So what I want to do is I want to really just take the opportunity to share some of the work that we've been doing and some of the approaches based on everything that we've talked through uh, thus far. You know, what are some of the things that we've been using um, with, uh, effectively to try and help? So how can we identify high potential? There's various facets, whether it's the interpersonal side of things, the adaptability, uh, the ability to lead, to make confident decisions. How can we do all that? but also take into consideration the needs to be the need to be quick, the need to be responsive, to be seamless, to be digitally savvy as a company, essentially. And so what I'd like to do is take this opportunity to introduce you to what we refer to as our graduate virtual job tryout. And again, if we go back to our, our, um, our sort of intelligent hiring platform at the start, Virtual job trial is just a synonym for our assessment, essentially. That's all we mean by this. So, uh, so a, a standardized assessment that candidates are completing as part of their recruitment journey. So it's quite a lot of information on screen there. But essentially what we're trying to do is we, we, we're really sort of priding ourselves on creating a job relevant assessment, hence the, 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 the name the virtual job tryout. We are trying to get as close as humanly possible to a job samples, which you know practitioners on the call will know is, again, one of the greatest predictors of performance. You try and get the candidate to do something that is as closely wedded to what they'd be expected to do in role as humanly possible. And so what we do is we get, we create what is known as a two-way exchange of information. Candidates have the opportunity to showcase what they can do, but try out, learn more about the job as they go. And doing that, if you think about kind of antiquated methods of assessment, I, I, I experienced one of these, and it's probably why I went into the industry that I did. You walk into a room, you sit down, and you more or less get grilled by a particularly belligerent hiring manager who gives you the classic line, you know, I can see a good uh, you know, graduate employee when I see one, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and it's 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 not helpful. It doesn't help the graduate. It doesn't help the, uh, the hiring manager. It certainly doesn't help the organization. What we're trying to do is create a two-way exchange of, of, of information where candidates can learn about the role and the, the opportunities that it can provide, but it also gives you the time to collect job-relevant uh, behavior and, and, and data points that are predictive. Again, tapping into those elements of potential we already talked about. We customize, we tweak to make sure that we also, you know, we don't neglect the marketing side of things. You know, we we understand that employers want to put their best foot forward. So we have to be able to customize and make it look appealing at the same time. The very the, the, one of the best things, I think, and I'm sure that the elements of our uh, our um, uh, IO team that would, would would absolutely agree, our team of business psychologists, that everything we use is automated in terms of its scoring. So that means that we can constantly refine and iterate and improve. We haven't got to manually go in and, and, and nor do our clients go in and assess candidates on a case by case. This slide, don't want to get too technical, but um, essentially um, it, it really does sort of bring bring things back to what we were saying about potential. You know, just looking at pure competence or past experience or behavioral side of things is no longer enough. We need to use what we refer to as a multi-method or modal approach, combining different forms of um, you know, different predictors, essentially. So you get one nice, well-rounded um, uh, hiring decision of much greater accuracy. And you can see there we are using relevant experiences, but it's not the be all and end all. We're looking at behavioral elements. We're looking at problem solving, advanced simulations and interviewing where you can look at maybe some of the more interpersonal stuff as well. So what this allows us to do is to create a work sample but it, that's informative, it's realistic and it's job relevant, but it's also immersive, seamless and straightforward as well. So I appreciate there's quite a lot of information on screen there, but I want to, very excited to kind of share with you um, the work that we are doing. So this is essentially a step-by-step -step of the virtual job tryout we are using. So take a take a, a moment or, or two just to have a have a look through. Um, but essentially a candidate would would, would complete uh, the, the virtual job trial running from left to right in sequence. Um, it goes without saying that everything you can see on screen there um, is accessible using smartphone as you can see. 
um, uh, uh, laptop, desktop, and, and tablet as well. Again, we're talking about digital natives. We need to make sure it's accessible in whatever form that they are most suited to or most, you know, uh, 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 are, are most confident and comfortable using. Um, and more importantly as well, from a technical side of things, they haven't got to download any technology. They've got not got to install anything complicated or anything like that. And everything is just moving seamlessly. They just hit next and they move through from one to the next. So starting on the left hand side, really kind of taking up where I left off um, concerning that two way exchange of information. We start our virtual job tryouts with what we refer to as the realistic job preview. It's a bit like an SS, uh, SSQ without any questions, essentially what we're able to do because we can fully customize all of the interface and things like that is we showcase to candidates what the role actually entails, what the culture of the organization is like. It can include anything from comments from, from actual candidates, grads, it can include anything you like, um, all the way through to, to, to text um, that's, that's written by hiring managers in, and incumbents. Um, and it includes uh, things like, um, you know, what, what it's really like working for the organization, but also the challenges as well. Um, I'm not trying to um, uh, cast aspersions when I do this, but for fairly obvious reasons, um, marketing efforts are always wed to your assessment process, which often creates a positive slant, maybe a bit of a rose tinted slant on what working at an organization is often like. I completely understand that you don't want to put people off. But at the same time, you want to give people a pragmatic understanding of what the role entails. So, you know, if candidates are going to be maybe dealing with you know, they're, they're young grads and they might not be used to this, but they might be dealing with some pretty inhospitable clients, some pre particularly demanding ones. Then that might be something that you talk about. Um, they might have to work maybe unsociable hours, long hours, lots of calls, you know, might get Zoom fatigue, things like all of this can be included. Um, but also it can be supported with um, indications of developmental opportunities. One of the things we're really seeing with the grads of today um, is that they they want a job, they want security in that job, but they want the they want the ability to learn and improve. You know, you often heard this idea, if you, if you, you know, past generations often talk about this idea of a job for life. And that was a good thing in, the, in, in that time because of the security that it provided. Grads now will not stay typically with a role if there isn't the opportunity for growth and development and new responsibilities and new challenges. So you can document those in this section as well. None of this aspect of the assessment is scored, um, it's purely informative, and we give this at the start so that candidates can step away if they need to, if it's not right for them. And then they go through, step by step, um, a sequence of challenges, again, drawing on that multi-method form of assessment. You see here, handling work challenges. This is very much, you probably, if you can read that text, it's, it's, it's somewhat small. But you can see how this is a very familiar situational judgment test, and it's, again, reliable form of assessment. It's been used paper and pencil for a long time but now we can automate it, we can score it straight away. And candidates are asked to respond to novel situations that they would realistically engage in in the role itself. And then they move on to another task. This one is more about abstracting meaning from complex data, the, the collaborate with colleagues, and they'd have to draw on lots of different resources and respond to different questions with a high degree of accuracy. It's a bit like an e-tray, but it's, it's made far more straightforward, far less laborious, far less time consuming, but contains all of that accuracy and predictive power. And then we're also interested in the learning more about the candidate. Ultimately, we want the candidate to tell us their story. So we're drawing on the relevant experiences, not all of the relevant work experiences, but experiences generally. Um, it's very important for a grad population. We don't want to lose people just because they haven't done an internship or they haven't got a wealth of experience they can draw on that kind of misses the mark. And then finally, we use forms of personality assessment just to, to, to use um, essentially to, to provide some key performance data, but also to support questions at a later interview stage. And you can see on screen there, we're using a mix of a normative, uh, you know, those classic like a sort of one to five, one to seven rating scales combined with an ipsative forced choice form of assessment where they're forced to make different choices. And what that means is you get a nice spike profile in how they see themselves in the workplace. And finally, in your own words, we move on to the final stage, which is an asynchronous video interview, essentially. And the video interview, it's, 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 it's visual audio. We have different forms of, of um, AIS interview as well, um, which includes text-based if you need to. And um, we understand that, you know, video interviews can be a little bit 
strange i've done one myself you know they're they're a little bit odd um and but they're they're here to stay it seems um and so what we need to do is make sure we provide candidates with the comfort and the ability to practice and rehearse and then get ready to really tell us all about themselves um i mentioned ais a moment ago and i appreciate i need to 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 clarify what i mean by that is the video interview portion, the questions that a candidate will be asked, are scored using our artificial intelligence algorithm or AIS, which is automated interview scoring. So I'm going to take just a moment. I'm just looking at time now. We're, we've, we've still got a little bit of time left. But uh, Modern Hire, if you've, if you've gone on our website and explored, you, you'd be familiar with the fact that we're using AI to support our assessment efforts and the assessment efforts of our clients. Um, we consider ourselves to be incredibly conservative with the way that we use AI. And by AI, we just mean very advanced statistics to help score our candidates. We see some incredibly positive results uh, from the, the work that we're doing already. So, for example, we always use informed consent when using AI, and we're getting anywhere between 98.5% to 99.5% of candidates are happy to be assessed using AI. And in fact, many of them suggesting in feedback that it's because they feel it's actually far more um, fair than a, than, a, than a manual rater. And the way that our AI model works, it works exactly um, like a highly skilled interviewer. If you think about what a highly skilled interviewer, I'm sure many of you are on the call, you go into a room, you ask a standardized question to a candidate, you take full verbatim notes, um, often to the detriment of your writing hand, um, and then you take that information away and you score it using a standardized rating scale only after the candidate has left the room. Essentially, our AI model does exactly the same thing. It takes a highly um, accurate transcription of what is being said, not how it's being said, but what it's what, what is being said and appraises it um, within the confines, very strict confines um, of a standardized rating scale and gives recommendations on the, the overall result that should be awarded on a, a one to five rating scale. Um, and we do this because what that means is we can free up our recruitment team time, we can make things far easier to score. And of course, um, uh, recruitment managers always have the opportunity to go in and look at the overall scores if they want to double check. Um, I don't want to, to spend too much time on the topic of AI, um, but I have often use the analogy of comparing AI to a highly effective intern. So if you think about what an intern does, they do the same task over and over again to a high degree of accuracy. Um, they don't make executive decisions. They don't go off piste. We use AI in exactly the same way. And that way we can create a glass box. We know what's being assessed. We know what the candidate said. This is the, the, the scoring um, rating scale that's being used. This is how it's been appraised and this is the overall score and we can work it backwards as well to show uh, the transparency and the decisions that are made. OK, so because everything's automated, uh, moving through fairly quickly now, because I know time is of the essence, but we have lots of reporting tools. We can provide overall scores to how the candidate did automatically. They're, they're uh, immediately available. Um, this is just a, a sort of a brief mock up. And you can kind of see dotted around um, how we can provide a breakdown of all of the, uh, the, the competencies or capabilities and the sub competencies that were being used. And again, marries up with what we were saying about high potential at the start of the conversation today. So this is our, our it's, we refer to it as a competency framework, but not to get confused. Um, we're talking about overall human potential here. And you can see how we have the social, interpersonal, softer skills, if you like, that's wrapped into it, the adaptability piece, the problem solving piece that we've talked about, the drive, the overall, and we can tap into all of those aspects that make up human potential. And this competency model has been validated. I think it's over my, the, the, the chief science officer may correct me, but I think it's over 400 studies have done validating this model. Um, and we use it to, to, to undergird, to support our AIS models, our NLP and natural, natural language processing models, as well as the question sets that go with it as well. Okay. Um, I don't want to, to, to sort of bludgeon you with too, too much information, but this is something that I just want to share, really, with multiple outcome optimization or MOO, um, at least it's very easy to recall in that sense. Essentially, what it allows us to do, um, because we're looking at the multifaceted nature of human potential, is that we can weight things differently if we need, if we need to, to create the most effective predictor of performance. And we can take into consideration things like diversity and inclusion and things like that and fairness in the process 
So we can weight all of those different variables, be it interpersonal skills, um, you know, drive task orientation in different ways to make sure that we're creating a fair process. We are tapping into human potential in the various ways it can manifest itself. Again, we're not looking at a one size fits all model. And these are just some of the some of the findings uh, that we've 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 found thus far. Essentially, you know, we've been very fortunate um, to be able to work with lots of different organisations, um, and we've been able um, to to demonstrate. Um, you know, lots of different sort of forms of, of ROI, essentially, including, um, you know, individuals are far more likely to be promoted based on high scores on the VJT. They're far more likely to ramp up and onboard effectively into the organization um, to do well on the VJT, often um, meant they'd be offered more full time positions if they started in the intern capacity um, and as well, more likely to achieve high performance ratings on the internal performance systems, too. So it's very good. It's, 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 it's certainly predictive in that sense. It's given us lots of rich feedback. Um, and finally, this one, uh, don't worry too much about the, the sort of the graphic imagery there. But um, uh, essentially, what we found, uh, in, in, we use the graduate VJT in the context of uh, entry level interns. Um, that we're looking to be converted to full-time employees. We found that the individuals scoring highly, so between four and five, were more, almost, almost two times as likely to receive full-time offers. So it's, it's a compelling finding on a very recent piece, piece as well. Lastly, I appreciate time is pressing, and I do want to give the opportunity for lots of questions. I know I've shared a lot of information today. We're using a, a product known as Find My Fit. So this is... Um, it's a bit of a bolt-on solution that we've been using, and essentially it's a brief interest uh, styles and background and aspirational assessment that helps candidates link how they see themselves. You can see there on that on the screen there the, the smartphone there, you know, questions that ask them to appraise themselves. We report on those findings and we can use AI um, to provide them with a range of different um, roles um, that are currently available. So this is just an example that's being used and we've rolled this out in the US to, effectively. And so just to summarize, we're able to provide a sort of a match based on the, you know, the various insights they've given us based on their various work styles. And then we move that on to potential recommended jobs as well. Okay, so I appreciate I've flown through that last part at a, at a rate of knots, a bit of a flurry there, but I wanted to make sure that we had enough time for questions. So, um, Steve, I don't know if, you, if, you, if you'd like to, 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 to rejoin, to come back in, but um, yeah, if there's, if there's any questions, I'm always happy to, to field them. And I just want to say thank you very much for listening thus far. Thanks, Simon. That was great. That was really um, informative. I think what struck me, and this is probably somebody who, um, showing my age a little bit, is how some of those fundamentals are really important. Time to hire, um, you know, good candidate experience, etc. It's um, And also that sense that, I always thought this, that good candidates... It's not all about speed. Actually, they want to feel that you show an organisation, you show candidates by being serious about how you assess them, how seriously you're going to take them when they um when they when they join. Um, if anybody wants to pop some Q and A um, questions in, either use the Q and A function or pop them into the chat. More than happy to to relay those through to Simon. I'm, I'm I'll um I'll keep an eye on those. Um, I think one of the first questions I had um just going through listening to what you were saying, um Simon, um. And actually, it's about we talk about the candidates that um, that get through and are successful. But actually, I guess one of the the flip sides of actually being able to use a lot more testing up front, do more online, be much more rigorous is, of course, actually candidates are using academic credentials less. So actually, they can they can initially sort of sift through more candidates. Um, do you have any thoughts on what that means for objective candidates? Is it something that you find with your clients that actually is actually making sure you can give a good experience to those that don't get through? The reason I say this, um, my, my, where I used to work, I was, um, I was talking to them a little while ago, and they get something like, you know, three times the applications that they used to when I was there 10 years ago, and they were in the thousands then. So I find those numbers quite eye-watering. So yeah, I just wonder what your thoughts yeah. on that were. No, I, I, it, it, I can draw on a, a personal experience of working with a client fairly fairly recently. So you mentioned about the kind of the swell in candidate applications. Um, I worked with a client uh, recently, as I say, and they received, um, I want to get this right, I think it was, it was like 12 times the number of candidates they were expecting. So it went from the hundreds into the thousands. And of course, they didn't have the, the recruitment team on staff to deal with all of this. They slowed it right down and they went through the process fairly. So they managed that. It drew things out quite considerably. Um, but of course, once you enter into a talent pool that's much larger than anticipated, the likelihood that you're going to be selected, talented or otherwise, by prob 
probability alone diminishes. Um, and so one of the things that that that, uh, that was done to 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 support this is is providing standardized detailed feedback to candidates, particularly if they were unsuccessful. Um, and what was done was that, um, you know, because of the automated nature of, of, of reporting these days, you can provide candidates with feedback independent of whether they're successful or unsuccessful. And that way you can support them in understanding the decision that's been made because we all know what human biases are like. Um, you know, we provide we we prefer bad theories to no theory at all. So when we're unsuccessful and we don't know why, we assume it's something pretty bad. I said something bad or the person didn't like me. Um, and so we can mitigate that. And I think it's our obligation to mitigate that um, by providing detailed feedback. And with candidates at the very final stage, you know, again, we're talking hundreds in, as opposed to, you know, the, maybe the, the tens they were expecting. Because of that swelling candidate volume, we're able to provide um, 10 to 15 minute feedback conversations. And it was really clear from speaking to graduates, all of the graduates, they started the conversation in more or the same way, absolutely dejected. They, they put loads of time and investment. Um, and they thought, again, as I've just said, they thought it was something that they'd done wrong. They weren't right. They weren't good enough for the company. The company didn't want them. Of course, none of this is true. In reality, you know, we're recruitment experts. We know what it's like. You stack rank your candidates and the cutoff is there. And unfortunately, they're just there. And, you know, if there was the, the anticipated number of candidates applying, they would have absolutely got that job. And that's a horrible thing to have to share. But by sharing that information, by telling candidates how the process works, and how well they've done, you can give them some feedback on what they can do differently next time. And what we're able to do is take a conversation which started with dejection and turn it into next time, come back and you can knock it out of the ballpark. That's that, that, yeah, great. Um, I had a question come through actually, and I think sure. probably some of the answers you've given, Simon, will we'll touch mm -hmm. on this as well. And um, um, somebody who says um, they often uh, get the feedback from candidates that the process is too anonymous um, and wanting some insight into you know who's made the, the 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 decision, the person making the decision. So the question is really about how do you combine that expectation with actually using AI supported tools? How can how can somebody get that that balance right with their candidates? Yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a good question. I think candidates want to know the, the inner workings these days, don't they? They're curious. They're generally a very curious bunch, which is fantastic. They want to know more um, about how something's been arrived at. And I think, I must admit, in the, in the nascent sort of stages of, of AI, this was a central problem. You may have been familiar with this idea of black box thinking or, or rather black box um, a, a, approaches where the decisions that have been derived, we've seen it used for you know, facial recognition and things like that, and scores have been achieved for measures of the big five personality, you, you can't actually show how that's been arrived at. So what you do, I mentioned in the, the, the earlier sort of presentation, um, you create a glass box model where it's really transparent. This is what the candidate said. Um, this is the standardized criteria that's been rated against. This is the overall score that was awarded. And what you can do is, if even if it's an AI model doing this, a, a representative, a recruitment manager from the organization can sit down and very clearly intuit one step to the next and reverse that order as well and sit down with a candidate if they've got any questions and follow up as a, it's, it's, a, it's an area of, 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 of passion of mine because you know I was I, I've, I've I've been a grad it's it's it is a, a a really scary experience as well it's a very intimidating experience with so many you know highly talented people rolling out of the university all at the same time um and so what I what we found is by talking to grads is that they want that clarity and as long as you can provide it, you can then, as I said before, turn a conversation that starts very negatively and turning it into, well, actually, I feel more comfortable now going forwards. I haven't lost hope, if you like. Uh, yes. And there's no getting away from the fact that there is an element that it's a, that there is a volume attachment to this. Yeah, I mean, that yeah, has always been yeah. the nature of the of the of the beast. Um a question actually from Phil, which that's something I was thinking about as well. So Phil said, Can you say any more re-diversity outcomes? And I was just going to ask you around actually changes in, in selection methodology for diverse outcomes, having, you know, is there anything that people need to think about differently to ensure that candidates from more diverse backgrounds who may not have, you know, we just talked about rejections. If you don't mm. kind of know that you've got to get through a lot of rejections, maybe to get the job you want and aren't prepared for mm. that, you might get um, 
um, you might get disappointed just with one knockback and not apply again. So, so anything more you'd like to say on the on the EDI front, Simon? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we've got a few white papers exploring this, and our, our head of uh, uh, EVP, uh, Eric Seidel, has, has, has written about this widely. So, um, the individual who, who's uh, I'm not looking at the chat function unfortunately currently, but um, the individual who's 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 um, who's asked that question is a great question to ask. We've got lots of insights where we've been able to increase. I think we talked about it in the the last webinar as well. We've been able to increase. Uh, the volume of of um, of hiring and successful hiring um, when it comes to various um, uh, you know diversity requirements and things like that, we've been able to do that, um, and a large part of that is providing clarity on the role. We're not asking candidates to ever um, use prior knowledge, if you like, um, for their graduate assessments. It is those transfer. We, we, the, the umbrella bucket term is transferable skills. And we're given them the opportunity to really showcase what they're all about and to enthuse, but to do it in a practical, practical sense. So that's what we're able to do. We're of, always conscious of, of language that's used, imagery that's used. Obviously, it's reflective and things like that. Um, but ultimately, we want to provide candidates with an opportunity to really showcase their ability and their enthusiasm. And if we're able to successfully do that, we can then support um, every individual get a you know get a get that next career opportunity. Um, and uh, another couple of questions coming through. I'm conscious of time, so um, I'll keep rattling through it. Apologies, I'm looking here. My neighbours have started grinding something in the. <laughs> Sounds like they see the trees being cut down or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a bit more severe than that. I think. Anyway, so hopefully you can't hear it at your end. Um, uh, so a couple of questions. I think we should get time before we finish. So one question is actually, and they're both to do really with, I guess, the onboarding piece. I guess uh, the sense almost happens after the, the selection bit. But um, any thoughts around the best way to keep those high potential um, graduates? Um, warm between that offering the job, signing the contracts, accepting, and then and then beginning. Is there any connection between, um, I guess, your processes and, and actually that happening? And then also, have you got any thoughts added on to that around actually how much the role does things like salary play now, especially in this current environment, compared to actually what the selection process can say about the key things around a job and, and development, etc. So, any thoughts on those two? Yeah, the, the the first one, it's a, it's, a, it's a really interesting question because I know that I've shared, hopefully not bleak statistics, but in terms of the the very quick turnover with high potential individuals, how quickly they're going to be looking at other offers. And I think the best thing could be, and I, and I know that there are, um, you know, they're just process issues when it comes to contracting and things like that and putting things together and legal teams have to sign off on roles and things like that. Um, and I know that that can be drawn out and it's no fault of the recruitment teams. I think the best thing that can be done is, is to engage, um, you know, I'm just sure it's, it's things that are already been doing, unfortunately, I'm not sure I can elaborate beyond that, but in terms of those, that, that more immersive contact that's being, that's being offered throughout those final stages, um, you know, often the complaint, it, it goes back to the question before is, people do want a bit more of a personal touch when it comes to their assessment, their recruitment journey. And we understand when the volume at that end is really high and you might be talking about hundreds, thousands, maybe even tens of thousands of candidates. It's very hard to do that bit face to face and to have all that um, good quality face to face engagement with recruitment managers. But as we move through, if we can automate this early stage and sift this down effectively, then when we get to the other end, we can hopefully um, invest more face to face time and keep those engagements up and just provide that clarity. You know, I think a lot of grads don't and maybe uh, may, um, uh, this is conjecture, but they they may not have the same working knowledge of, of what's going on in the background. They don't understand maybe why, 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 you know, I've been offered a job. What, what, what's the next, where's the next step you know where where's the clarity around what I'm doing so anything that can be done to free up recruiter time to provide that clarity I think is a is a, is a good opportunity for us um the next question sorry I will just double check um what was written yeah, that was, um, yeah. around salary yes just what role does salary play in encouraging or, or not encouraging high potential graduates from applying or pulling out of a process yeah, I, I think it's it's that, that classic thing, isn't it? I, I get I see myself maybe as slightly more skeptical than the average person, but you know, it's 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 often that question. I remember being asked it when I first started out, why do you want to work here? And I think there was a time, I think it's changed now. There was a time where um, you know, I think I think a lot of organizations um adopted that idea of you want to work for us and almost pledge allegiance to us. And I think that times have shifted now. And I just remember being asked that question as a, as, a, as a lowly graduate, almost or seeing myself as a lowly graduate and thinking, because I want to get paid, um, you know, and it's it's an unfortunate reality. Um, but um, and salary does play into it cons 
considerably. But I think what can be done is if the salary can't quite be at market rate, it's not the end of everything. Uh, if it's slightly lesser than, say, competition, what can be done is the mapping, the exploration of, you know, it's a, it's a business cliche these days, but I like to use it all the same, which is, you know, the art of the possible mapping out what are the development opportunities? What can this organization do for you in the years that follow? You know, can where can you see yourself? Um, and again, grads aren't expected to have all the answers, but companies can map out, realistically speaking, um, you know, there is the opportunity to take on these responsibilities, to do these things, to engage in these projects. And I think that can sometimes help offset if a salary can't quite be where a candidate expects or where a competitor is able to provide. Fantastic. Great, Simon. A good, so interesting subject to end it on. The, um, I've had more conversations with people calling us up for, for sort of salary information and, and intel on the market than, than um, in the last sort of two months, I think, than in the last 10 years combined. So it just shows actually how much the, the reality of what we see in the news impacts um, our, our, in our candidates market. So Simon, that was a really interesting and informative session. Thank you very much. Lots and lots of content there. So um, as I said at the start, um, if, you, um, if you'd like to catch up um, on any of the content or sharing the content, you will be getting a link to the webinar and it will also be on our website. Simon, of course, will be more than happy to, to answer any questions that you may have for him in the, in the follow up. He shared his email with you. Um, and, um, and, um, and, 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 so I was going to say, I think it's 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 really interesting going into this. I've not gone into a recruitment season. I think with so much uncertainty around, just quite how's the market going to play out? Partly coming out of the pandemic and also the impact, of course, of um, of what we know in terms of the economy. So I think it's going to be an interesting um, interesting few months coming up. And what a great way to start! So um, a great introduction to that, Simon. Much appreciated. And thanks okay. to Modern Hire for supporting us and supporting us through through this content and the webinar. Much uh, much appreciated. Thank you so much for your time, everybody. Cool. Thanks all. Thanks, Simon. Talk to you all soon. Thanks all. Bye now.